Hello, this is Scott Conway, uh, popularly known as Grandmaster Scott with one T. And now I've had some interesting things come up with the Grandmaster question. Um, <clears throat> I am a martial arts Grandmaster. The station took me 45 years of training to earn. Um, some people have asked me like, so are you like a chess Grandmaster? Are you a Grandmaster in the Masons? I'm going to just assume you're not like a rapper Grandmaster Flash. Uh, uh, wh where did that grandmaster come from? And, and it is from martial arts. I am the, a grandmaster in Guardian Kempo Kajuko Do is the name of the martial art. And while I've been training since 1971, that we established that martial art in 1990. So this year is our 30th anniversary. And the martial arts dojo and the martial arts system is where we fielded the Ohana way as a cultural system at the same time we were doing the physical martial arts system. So my newest books that are now up on Amazon is the Ohana way 2.0 30th anniversary edition and then the Ohana way fundamentals and then the discover Ohana workbook. So the 30th anniversary edition isn't because I published the book 30 years ago but because we began the Ohana experiment as part of the martial art. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, we've been after this. And I just did a, an interview with uh, Renshi, which is a, a master title for us, Renshi Deborah Hicks, who was there 30 years ago when we began. And her nickname is Giggle Bunny. And so if you watch the interview, you can see that she still has some of her giggly reflexes. And part of the the power of the Ohana rules even back then, because I, I didn't want to train children. I just wanted to train teens and adults. And so you had to be 13 to train. And she argued for having kids in the program. And if she didn't know it was a safe place to disagree with the boss and that it was a safe place to make your case opposite what the boss has already decided, and if she didn't know that you know, we could have differences and, and we would just navigate the differences and, and that was okay. And if she didn't know it was okay to be assertive so long as she had a forward and she was doing it on purpose and she did it with respect and she knew how to do that. And she didn't trust in me showing up as my highest and best self and we didn't have that aloha loving spirit. I would have lost out on, let's see, we had about a 450% increase in business over like three phases, thanks to that one discussion and her knowing she could have it was responsible for increasing business from where we were at to where we landed because of it, 450%. So the difference for me in my early business work between having Ohana and not having Ohana was a 450% increase in my business. That is wild when you think about that because uh, Deborah, by, by, and she'll tell you herself, she is by default a very passive person. Sometimes when she has really, really strong feelings on something, she'll be a bit more assertive. But her natural personality isn't going to stand up to a strong personality. But here, because of Ohana, she knew she could. And as a result, I benefited a 450% increase in my business. So do you want to know what my number one blind spot is as a leader? I don't know. That's why it's called a blind spot. <laughs> and because we built these systems to help fix blind spots, I was able to have that increase in my business way back in the 90s. When we started off at, at, at rec centers and then we built out this commercial school and eventually we moved to Spring Valley, which is now closed. I posted a picture of it because it's rubble. I mean, literally they have physically torn down the building. But I don't know what my blind spots are. That's why they're called blind spots. Now I'm half joking when I say that because honestly, I do know what some of my blind spots are, meaning that I know by default, I won't see them. And when you get blindsided by something, it can be a jarring experience. And in business, it can be an expensive experience. 
Now, particularly with Deborah, it was a lucrative experience having a system in place that actually addressed what the common blind spot is. And if you don't know it's there, it can be expensive to have it hit you. Now, I'll tell you a few things I know personally. Um, as an attorney, because I'm also an attorney, which is, is actually a momentary bit of fun on that, I was having a conversation and a longtime business friend of mine was talking about this situation. And I'm sitting down there with a date and my date spent years working in the insurance industry and had been a fraud investigator and, and was providing some guidance. And then she turns like, well, and of course, Scott can help you by looking at the paperwork you know, as a lawyer. And she turned me and went, wait, you're a lawyer? So, so yes, <laughs> I'm an attorney. Uh, I have mostly retired from most of my legal practice, but I am still a business attorney licensed in the state of California. And one of my business clients came to me in big, big trouble because he did a thing so badly that he lost his general manager and the entire office staff because of how badly he handled something. And ultimately he never recovered. His three generation business shut down within two years. And what the reason he came to me, he came to me as a lawyer to try to help untangle this legal consequences of the mess he had created. And while I could help him with some of the lawsuit stuff, there's not a lot of I can do for him when he blew it so badly, just on a human level, that his general manager and his entire office staff quit. Now, more commonly, it alienates just a few people at a time. You're not normally going to blow out your entire office staff and suddenly you have a business and no one is running the front office. Normally, you might alienate one or two of your key team members and you'll lose like one person at a time, maybe two people or three people at a time if you have a larger team. It's not common to mess up that badly, but people do it. It can and does happen. I've seen it. And also commonly, and you'll see this, is it will lose you one or two clients at a time. It's not common that someone alienates their entire client base. That it's happened. Uh, I haven't personally seen that one yet, but I have watched clients who have managed to alienate a handful of key clients and it's cost them 20, 25% of the business because they handled something poorly. They got blindsided by a key thing that they forgot that they weren't looking at. And of course, as a lawyer, you can imagine a lot of people come to me with litigation going on and now they need a lawyer's help had already been whacked upside the head. So that's what I've seen more often. Is the, the big ones have sometimes come to me as a lawyer hoping that I would be able to help them but for the most part, at the lawyer level, it's, it's damage control. But at the human level, if we could catch it beforehand, it doesn't have to be that kind of problem. It's a thousand times better to never have the problem in the first place. And that's what we're looking at here. Now, we're warning before I get to what the, the most common number one leadership blind spot is, is I've run into leader after leader who acknowledge it, well, other people have this particular blind spot, but not them. Now, some of them honestly are right, but most of them are wrong. And it's an unfortunate truth that we can see much more easily in others than we can see in ourselves. And I will also share this. I know a lot of leaders that do see it. They know it. They admit it. They're constantly keeping an eye out for it because they know this is a big issue. And they know that it will catch them every once in a while because they forget. And those leaders will work to make sure it never catches them on anything big. And part of the way they do that is by paying attention to when it catches them on something small. They work to make sure they have a framework to work from to protect them. And for me, that's Ohana. That's why Deborah knew even 30 years ago that she could have this disagreeing argument with me and that she could make her case and that she could even keep making her case even when I was making a counter case. And she could keep looking for more examples to, to bring to me because she knew it was safe to do so. 
because there was a framework in place to protect me from myself. Now, it's not 100%. I wish it were. I wish anything was 100%, but we're all still human. Now, let's look at some of the bigger symptoms. So when we start talking about the blind spot itself, we will already know what's there. Some of the bigger symptoms. Have you ever had a regular job? Have you ever been let go yourself when you were pretty sure you were better at the work than someone that they kept at the job? Big sign. Chances are you've watched that happen to other people where you, you've watched someone or you've heard about someone who lost a job and they sincerely believe that they were the better worker. And in fact, for me, day before yesterday, I was having lunch with someone who was exactly that. Not only did she believe she was the better worker, she had been told by her bosses that she was the more effective worker, she was a more efficient worker, that she got better results. And when things began to get difficult, she was also the first one they let go. Now, here's a big one more as a leader. Do you frequently have the exact same conversation again and again to get the same thing done? Where you feel like all you're doing is you're dusting off the exact script you used before to try to get the exact thing done that didn't get done before. And you're trying to get it done the same way again. If this happens with employees, it's particularly an important sign because you're supposed to be in charge. So they're just supposed to do what you say. And so commonly that's tied into this blind spot. If it happens with peers or partners, it's not as big of a sign, still, still a sign. As an employer or as a project manager, as anyone who has to like put a team together, whether you're putting it together out of a group or you're putting it together with volunteers, but especially if you're hiring, are good team members hard to find and keep? And this can be employees, project team members, collaborative masterminds. Do you find good people hard to find? And when you find them, do you find them hard to keep? If so, that's one of the signs of this particular blind spot. And have you ever had an employee quit? So obviously this is an employer thing. Now it happens to everyone in business, but here have they left your company to go work somewhere else where their new position is not a big step up. Now, if someone leaves working for me and they go work somewhere else where they're making literally twice as much money, you go, okay, that might not be a sign. That, that could be the sign of an economic step up. Like the, the first employee I had come quit with me and she was like heartbroken over quitting working for me, but she had a chance to go work somewhere else where she was gonna make 150% what I was paying her. All right, that, that's a big leap up. There's a really important reason why someone would do something like that. But what if I'm paying someone $30,000 a year to do a job and then they quit working for me to go somewhere else to work for about the same money doing about the same thing. Then that tells you, okay, there's some other dynamic going on that it's not about the work and it's not about the money. We, we see that a lot. So it's a, and it's a 10 times bigger sign of the person who quits was one of your better employees. And especially if anyone leaves for a lower paying position, that's another 10 times sign. So if someone leaves, they're one of your better people and they leave to go somewhere that pays less, that's a hundredfold sign. And have you ever had a client just take their business elsewhere? Now that happens to everyone, but in particular, have they ever gone to a competitor that you believe is definitely not a much, much better value? That's a sign. And the more important the client, the bigger the sign. A few smaller, more common symptoms. If you catch yourself making sweeping remarks, such as, oh, millennials are so dot, 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 just fill in the blank there where you, you look at a group, uh, and a group that is a significant pool of team members, a significant pool of clients, a significant pool of your know, people you would work with, business to business or whatever, and that you talk about, like, oh, those kind of people are so, you know, business owners are so this, millennials are so that. That's a sign. And it's when we tend to not notice that when we start talking about some of these things, we begin to hopefully realize like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And one of the things is I used to tell millennials when, you know, 
the millennials or the teens and the 20s is most of the complaints about millennials are just because you're young and you're inexperienced. And when you guys are this old, chances are you'll complain about some other cohort and you'll talk about them as, well, this generation, but really it's just gonna be because they're young and inexperienced. The legitimate part of the complaint is going to be fixed by getting a little bit of life experience and getting a little bit of work experience and all those problems will tend to go away. 80% of the things that get complained about about young people is just stuff you haven't experienced yet. It's not that big a deal. It's not your whole generation. And so if you just learn a few things and get some experience, then it, you'll fix it yourself. Another one is if someone is frustrated with others. Now this is any others. And it's like, like, all I ask them to do is, or what's wrong with people that is, that's an indicator of this problem. If your reflex is to blame others, even if there might be a way that you could influence the behavior or the outcome, another sign. And if you're frustrated with people, but upon reflection, what frustrates you seems like it's a fairly common human failing. It's a fairly common limitation. Uh, uh, one of the examples that I'll, I'll use sometimes is someone who said that they would bring me something and they keep forgetting. Okay, people forget stuff, that's fairly normal. If I keep getting angry over a normal human thing, that's an indicator. And wondering why people can't just do their jobs. And so when I'm deciding what other people's job is and, I'm, and whether I have a right to or not and how they ought to do their jobs and however they ought to do their jobs often is however I want the job done, regardless of whether that's a reasonable human behavior, that I'm not looking at why would this be happening? I'm just complaining that it's not going the way I wish it was. And here's another one. Now, now this tends to be an entrepreneur problem. Uh, sometimes it's an executive problem, more often it's a business owner problem, is using yourself as a standard for other people's behavior. And it's, well, I can do dot, 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 why can't they? Well, part of it is if, if they could and they did, then they'd be the entrepreneur and they wouldn't be working for you. But especially if you're a leader, if you're an owner, or you otherwise have training or a particular temperament to achieve your current level of success, using yourself as a standard for other people's behavior, thinking that just because you can, they should, is a sign. Couple of costs. Now you've already seen some of this show up, but think about some of the costs of those results we've been talking about. If a $30,000 client leaves, that's a $30,000 blind spot. If you lose a team member, replacing an employee costs anywhere from about $3,000 to $7,000 to replace in direct costs, just a, a typical hourly employee. And direct costs, lost productivity, the time and money it takes to onboard someone and to train a new person. So that's three to $7,000 over this blind spot. And if a company loses a leader, the numbers on replacing a leader is it costs anywhere from 50% to 250% of the annual salary of the leader. So if you lose, like if you're a small business owner and you, you have maybe 10 to 20 people and you lose your office manager, like happened to that one client who came to me too late. Figure if that's a $100,000 employee, that's going to cost anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000 to replace that leader before you're back to full productivity. And of course, the bigger ones. I'm a lawyer, so obviously one I'm familiar with is litigation, and there's never knowing what that could cost, especially if it's outside the scope of insurance. And then a huge one, and this is one we don't think about a lot, losing a referral source. If someone sends you business and then they stop, a whole stream of income comes to an end. And it's the same with losing a network. I had one client want to learn some of this, the material that I teach and will specifically be talking about today, how to have these particular conversations. When it occurred to her that if I lose this group, I'm losing a network. I'm not even losing a, an individual relationship with an individual referral source. I'm losing access to this entire network. I might benefit from not losing the entire network. Because if I'm just even getting one or two referrals a month through this network, and I've lost the whole network, I'm losing 
not just a client or two, I'm losing a stream of clients. So I need to protect my access to the network. Because if you lose a referral source or you lose a network, there is no telling what that cost is. So what is the blind spot? Now that this is the scary part. And I, I, I always have to ask leaders to hear me out because some leaders I talk to are very dismissive at first. Some leaders even scoff or get angry at the idea that this is their blind spot. Or they think that, you know, I'm being dismissive. Now, you know it's important. We've laid out how important it is. So I'm going to trust you to like stick with me far enough to make sure you've got it. But here's a key. Every time we actually study this issue, this related issue, we find out that it is the main problem seven out of 10 times. And even though it's the main problem seven out of 10 times, leaders consistently do not recognize this as their blind spot. That's why I'm laying it out the way I'm laying it out. It costs team members, it costs clients, it costs leaders. It's important to know, and we often think we already know, and then we get blindsided. And if we distill the blind spot down to its simplest possible one word term, it's this, people. Now let's pause here for a moment and consider at this very simple level. How can people be a leader's blind spot? Having people you're leading is the defining characteristic of a leader. How can the defining characteristic of a leader be the leader's blind spot? Well, part of it is that some leaders see their employees, their vendors, their partners, their contractors, and clients as roles rather than people. It's like they're cogs in the machine, and they're expected to do as they're told and always get their job done. And in fact, many leaders would like hear this and think, well, of course, because that's their job. I mean, they're supposed to do the lawyering. They're supposed to do the accounting. They're supposed to answer the phones. What, why can't they just do their jobs? And now for some leaders with some teams, that works until it doesn't. Because the way you lose good people is by not acknowledging them and treating them and understanding all the dynamics of them as people. So that's a fundamental. Now, here gets to be an interesting thing when you're dealing with a lot of, of businesses. And when I talk to business consultants, I run into this a lot, where they say that a lot of the managers they work with don't think of themselves as leaders. They think of themselves, well, well I'm a lawyer, I'm not a leader, and, and yet he's my paralegal, and, and this is my legal secretary, and that's the receptionist. They don't think of them as people, they think of them as a role occupied by a person who's just there to do a job. They really honestly think of their people as cogs in a machine, that fulfill a job description and they forget that there's a human being in the role. So the people is the one word distillation, but if I expand it a bit, it's this, that the leadership blind spot, slightly more expanded so that we can follow it better is whole people with whole lives. Now, this is part of what I mean by that. It means that even if we have a sense of our people as people, we sometimes forget the whole person, whole life part. In every life, there's a backstory. So when I have my receptionist at the front desk, and what we'll just assume my receptionist is a woman, is she's got a backstory. She's got a whole life that happened before I hired her to sit at that desk, greet clients when they walk in the door and answer the phones. And that whole life came before we connected. Now also, she has a whole life happening behind the scenes. Her whole universe doesn't begin at nine and end at five. There's this whole life going on behind the scenes, all the parts of lives that we don't see. And they have experiences, hopes, dreams, and a thousand true things about them outside the scope of her employment, outside the scope of, of what I might think of as leadership if I only treat her as the job she fulfills. And even the best of leaders will sometimes miss that part, that she doesn't magically appear at nine and then magically vanish at five into the ether. She didn't come into existence the day that she applied for the job with me. But there's a, 
a whole person connected there and that dynamic will affect her work positively and negatively. And if I can be aware, just aware of that, that can help me leverage the positives better and mitigate the negatives just with the awareness. And if I really know how to operate with that, I can get any given individual who occupies the role to function at a much higher level in an individual way beyond just the, the check marks of the list of things that has to be done. Even the best of leaders will sometimes miss this part, that when we nail it, we nail it. But when we miss, we miss. Now, for most of us, it's very individual. And we do it as a matter of character and personality. And of course, we have our own human failings. But that just means that sometimes we get it right and sometimes we make mistakes. And the more we have an objective standard, the better we can self-evaluate. Because one of my challenges with a lot of people and a lot of things is a lot of people go on feelings and opinions, but they don't have an objective standard. Now, you can be self-referenced to an objective standard. If you have an objective standard, you can self-reference yourself too. If you're going to self-reference based upon how I feel, well, then you actually just self-reference to an emotional reaction to a thing. And very often, that's what I see leaders do. They self-reference to the fact that, well, I'm in charge. Okay, well, in which case, anything you did was fine. Like, well, well, how do I get my employee to? I said, well, what do you want them to do? And it's this, this whole consultive process that essentially boils down to your employees are people. They're, you can't just push a button and a thing happens. So they're not an electronic. They're a human being. Now let's take the blind spot one more step because this one did an enormous amount of damage in one of the cases I watched. And I can see it coming, just business and society wide, is whole people with whole lives serving whole people with whole lives. And the serving here is multiple meanings. Our client facing team members are serving our clients. Our clients are also whole people with whole lives. And we may be able to set policy and certain issues with our team members, but we have much more limited control over our clients and even less over prospects. And we can take any recent set of political issues, social issues as an example. We can set an internal policy that we as a business and we as business employees will be silent on political issues. And you know, every four years, every election season, you know, country kind of divides themselves up and the sides go at each other. And we can decide as a business, we're just gonna leave politics out of business. But you can't tell your clients to leave politics out of business. The customers are gonna show up with whatever their political opinions are. And if they are diametrically opposite your opinion and they're mean about it, but you just told your employees like you're not allowed to talk about that. Your employees could be feeling victimized and brutalized by a client that has no governors on them. So sometimes we or members of our team may disagree, perhaps passionately, and we can set policy on what they're allowed to do, but we can't set policy on what they're allowed to think. We can't set policy on what they're allowed to feel. We can't set policy on all of the things that they're thinking about saying that they would definitely say if it wasn't gonna cost them their job. And how easy would it be for a client to completely alienate one of our key team members or even alienate us, but we need that client to do business? How do we navigate that? If we need the client for income and we need the team member for the work, but we have a conflict, how, how do we handle that? Now, I, I've had colleagues who have shared that they've lost employees because of the behavior of clients. Now, admittedly, the not my client business owner reflexively blamed the employees for not understanding business. Now, my perspective is a little different. So let, let, let's look at more evidence of the blind spot in that particular case. So consider my colleague, fellow business owner, but he thinks his employees just don't understand business. Well, let's even assume that's true. If you have team members who don't understand something, you need them to understand what do you do? 
you train them. If you have a product that they don't understand, what do you do? You teach them what you need them to know about the new product or the new service or the new something. So if you need them to quote unquote understand business, you teach them the part of business you want them to understand. And then you and they can make intelligent decisions about how good a teamwork fit you are without waiting for the crisis to just blow things out all of a sudden. That's a human blind spot. That's the owner forgetting the simple reality of having people working for the business. If something has business consequences and your team needs to know something, make sure they know it. And then there's more on the human dynamic. Well, people don't like to be mistreated. And even if the employer is not directly mistreating anyone, and that was his defense, well, it's not like I'm doing it. It, but he was openly allowing the client to do it and expecting his employees to just accept being mistreated. Okay, well, that's back on the employer. So can, can you see the evidence of, of the people blind spot in that? Because he's not recognizing that, yes, it might be true that you're not mistreating your people, but you are allowing your people to be mistreated and you're doing nothing about it. So what do you do about it? Well, without any real special training, I mean, some of you can literally walk out of this short seminar three minutes from now and improve is the simple answer. It's the golden rule. Now, most simply, it's just treat people well. But the trick then is to be aware of how easily we forget about the people involved as whole people with whole lives. If we just spend a few moments to consider the innate humanity of all the stakeholders, we can genuinely improve our decision making. Just with that, that one little golden rule tweak, before I engage with human beings on things, just pause and go, okay, they're people, just like I'm a person. How would I want this handled if I was on the other side? What would be a normal human limitation on this? What would be normal people problems on this? Now, now, here's a simple example that doesn't have to do so much with conflict. It's just a normal human memory problem. I was doing an event at work. I needed a DVD to fit a theme. Was, we were going to have a kid's room and we we're going to play a movie on television. I had a team member who owned a copy of that movie and offered it to me. And I needed it for that scheduled event. So I, I, it has to be here by a particular day and time. It's not just an open-ended thing. And she said she'd bring it to me. That seems simple enough, right? Just, you know, assuming she would remember would be a common blind spot. But here's one of the things that I know. I know that many of us, which includes me, leaves work and our brain leaves work too. So I trust that's happened to all of us. On her way home, she has home things to be thinking about. And how easy would it be for the home her to forget that the work her was going to bring me a disc? So what we did was a simple solution that honored the fact she is a whole person, she has a whole life. If she agreed to bring me the disc and to receive a text from me later in the evening to put the disc in a place that would come with her. Because I'm asking her to do something that's out of routine. So if the home her has a routine to get ready for work, she might walk in the door and go like, I was supposed to bring the thing. Ah, oh, sorry, I forgot tomorrow. Well, if I only have three days for her to remember and she forgets three times in the road, I've got a problem because I need that disc. So instead, we made the agreement that I would just text her. Now, by the way, if I forget to text her, whose fault is that? I'm the one that needs the, the disc. I should be able to remember it. And so I texted her long enough after work so that she would logically be home and ask for her to text me back when she had it someplace that came out. And in her case, she decided to put it in the car. So that she knew, it's like, well, I might take that purse or I might take that bag, but I know I'm driving my car. And so she put it in her car and then she texted me and told me it was in the car and then I got my disc. So what is that is both of us just acknowledging the innate humanity, the people to people things. Now, if you want to be more advanced than just basic golden rule, because a lot of times we look at things and go, well, I already know the golden rule. I still have these problems. Or my client already knows the golden rule and they still have those problems. Or 
because all of us have learned this, but look at all of the people problems we're still having. So when we want to get more advanced, we're looking at a shareable culture, we're looking at integrity, and we're looking at a system of how we handle these things. And, and for some of that, I'm going to pull up a, a shared file and kind of touch on a practical application for exactly how we do some of this. So let me do a share screen here. And a lot of that has to do with the one conversation method. Now we already know in, in our particular case that conflict costs. We've, we've talked about how expensive it is to replace people, how expensive it is to lose a client. But part of the one conversation method has to do with never again having the same conversation twice to try to accomplish the same thing that didn't work before. It is amazing how often we use plan B is the exact same as plan A. But the reason we're on plan B is plan A already didn't work. And so that's one of the ways th this is crafted. And so what I'm gonna share with you is the Ohana conversation and how to apply that. Now, some of you have, may have seen this already. Hawaii, or Ohana is a Hawaiian word for family. You could think of it as everything positive that family is supposed to be. I also teach it as, as an acronym, Oasis, Harmony, Assertiveness, Nobility, Aloha. And I told you the power of Deborah knowing this is the culture. And for Oasis, meaning be a refreshing refuge, be a safe person is she knew that she could have this disagreement and that would be okay, and it was safe. And she knew that we didn't have to be the same to be together, that was harmony. She knew so long as she's being assertive rather than aggressive, that she can make her case. She could count on us showing up as our highest and best selves, and she could count on that aloha spirit. And because of that 450% increase in my business, back back in the 90s and then going into the 2000s this ohana concept is priceless all think about this all the positive aspects of family and if it saves just one important business relationship it can have a huge dollar value too so even with the most positive family culture we are still human and we will have problems and so we will have need to have what i call a change conversation uh, very often what, what I call a change conversation is, is really often just a rant and a blaming fest and a demanding of other people to do what they need to do. But if you look at it as a change conversation, I'm having a conversation in which I would like a change to take place. That it, it allows you to approach these things much more constructively. So the Ohana change conversation, the Ohana way of having conversations when something must change. Now here's a basic model. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Framework, conversation, change. The framework just means that you have some perspectives coming in. You have a way you're already seeing it, a way you're already thinking about it, and you have a way you are filtering and expressing it. So that's just your starting framework. And then when you engage in conversation, you come out of that framework and then everyone has a conversation strategy in some way, shape or form. And then everyone has some way they try to create change. More commonly, it kind of feels like this, where it's the, the framework, there's still always the framework, but then when they come into the conversation, you, you kind of land on the pointy end. And when it comes to the change part, you kind of get hit by the pointy end. The framework is commonly emotion, blame, and attack. The people have emotion about something. They're feeling overwhelmed. And so they all already want to freeze or they're feeling hurt. So they already want to create space or they're feeling angry. So they go on the attack or they feel fearful. So they're hiding from something or they're casting blame. Now I define blame as a claim to powerlessness. So if I'm supposed to be giving a seminar presentation in San Diego and I'm in Chicago snowed in, and I'm blaming the weather and the fact they canceled all the flights for why I'm not there. Here we go. All right, well, that makes sense that you, you are, are powerless to get to San Diego on Saturday morning if on Friday you got snowed in and the flights got canceled. Totally legit blame. But on the other hand, if I'm supposed to give a Saturday presentation in San Diego 
And on Sunday morning, I'm in Los Angeles and I canceled my flight to San Diego. You go, that's a two hour drive. You could rent a car. You could take a bus. You could take the plane. Hey, you, you could practically walk. You could call anyone in San Diego that you're supposed to be giving this feature and they could drive up and pick you up. And so you can blame the fact there and, and make the claim to powerlessness, but the fact is that you had like half a dozen or a dozen different ways to successfully do that. Right? We, we aren't going to blame you if you're stuck in Chicago 2,000 miles away, but yeah, you know, it'd be totally legit to blame you that you're 120 miles away at LAX. You could have totally gotten here. And also, very often, people will go on offense. They go on the attack. On the communication strategy, I call it backwards communication. And that's when you demand to be understood. Someone else has to hear you out. But you don't know where they're starting. You don't know what their perspective is. And often, you're not even defining your terms. And very often, when I'm engaging in like the hot button political topics of the day and, and if you follow me on social media, you might have seen me directly address some of these things. That I'm trying to get a definition of terms because like finding out, when you find out more of what someone means when they say something, you go, oh, okay, well, I don't disagree with that. And when you realize how much you don't disagree with something, it is, okay, so let's establish our common ground and let's find out how limited is our actual disagreement. And as I talked about one time in a, a more politically oriented version of this discussion, we laid out how we got a diametrically opposed argument distilled down to like two or three factual differences that then we could look up and discuss, as opposed to having these global battles. But most people don't want to go that far. They don't want to understand where the other people are coming from. They don't even sometimes want to define their terms. They just demand to be understood. That's common, especially when you're coming from emotion, blame, attack, and then to be understood. No define, no understand. And then how do they want it, change to happen? They will just want to demand the change. And then it's supposed to happen, why? Because I demanded it. Or they'll try to manipulate someone. They'll try to like trick someone into not being allowed to express their opinion. They'll try to box them in corners where they're not allowed to express a counterpoint. Or they'll just like outright use force. They'll do what we say you're going to do or you're fired. Do what I say you're going to do or we're going to shut down your business. Do what I say you're going to do or, or, or. Where it's a force-based solution. But notice there's always a version of this. You always have some kind of framework, some kind of conversation strategy, some kind of change method. Now, without getting into details, you know, my framework is Ohana, Oasis, Harmony, Assertiveness, Nobility, and Aloha. And the, the change conversation embodies all of that. That we connect rather than confront, that's Ohana. No one has to have their guard up because of the way we do these conversations, that's Oasis. Harmony by seeking the understanding and collaboration, so that's Harmony. Assertiveness by having forward purpose and respect. Nobility by calling on our joint highest and best selves, and then Aloha, by aiming toward what's best for all. Now the framework I'll, I'll teach here is hero, villain, victim. And I call this the Ohana 101 frame. And th this is actually in the 30th edition book. It, it was so 101 it didn't make the first book because the first book was originally written for my martial arts students. And this is like always in the background. It's like automatic for us. But I put it in the, the 30th anniversary edition Hero, villain, victim, the hero is the one who makes it better. The villain is the one who makes it worse. And the victim is the one for whom it is made worse. So you use the hero, villain, victim framework and the idea is to come to someone to recruit them to be the hero. Because ultimately, if I'm having a conflict with a client or I'm having a conflict with a worker or I do business to business, I'm having conflict with one of my vendors or conflict with somebody in my network. What do I want? Well, ultimately I want them to help me make it better. Commonly what I see is the framework people come from is why I'm the victim and they're the villain. And then they initiate the conversation with the villain frame trying to convince the other person, you're the bad guy, you're the bad guy, you're the bad guy. Now suppose we have an hour to talk and I'm gonna spend half of my time convincing you you're the bad guy. And as soon as you're absolutely convinced you're the bad guy, I'm gonna turn around and recruit you as the good guy. 
why did I just spend that whole first half of the conversation arguing for the opposite of what I'm after? Why am I wasting 30 minutes of my time arguing, you're the one who made it worse, you're the one who made it worse, you're the one who made it worse, when really all I want is for you to help me make it better. So the hero frame starts off with this idea like, I want your help making it better. So I'm gonna start off assuming you would like to help me make it better. And the fact that it became a problem through you is irrelevant because my problem isn't with you, my problem is the problem. The problem is the villain, not the person. Now here's a simple way you can tell. So what if I have this ongoing relationship with this person? Well, we'll go back to my receptionist. Well, she's constantly producing value for me. We generally speaking have a good relationship, but now for whatever reason we have the problem. A client showed up and was hyper-political on an issue that she diametrically disagrees with, was trying to create an argument, and she was really good about not saying anything, but now she's really upset, and she would like me to do something about it. And if we have the conversation, what does she want from me? She wants me to help her make this better so that she doesn't have to go through this again. Well, what's the problem? Well. Does she have a problem with me? Does she even really have a problem with the client? What if the client showed up and never said any of those things? What if the client's behavior was completely different? Does she have a problem with the human being? No, she has a problem with the behavior. So the problem is the villain, not the person. So we are getting together as a team of heroes to defeat the villain, which is the problem. Does that make sense? And you see that how key that distinction is. Because then even if she sees me as some way responsible for the existence of the problem, she knows she's not coming, well, you're a bad employer because this thing happened. Instead, she's like, I know you would like this to be better. And I know that you don't want me to have to put up with that kind of thing again. How can we work together so that we can help make sure this doesn't happen again. What am I allowed to do as a receptionist? What are you going to do as the employer? What authority am I going to have to be able to just, you know, ask him to be quiet because he's being obnoxious? Can I get up and leave? Yeah, that, that in some way to work out the solution. And then for the conversation, the communication, that she's going to begin with the frame of my employer wants to help. My team member wants to help. If I'm having a conversation, I assume you want to help make it better. And the conversation, the communication simply begins this way. You understand conversation is about connection. Connect first. That's the whole person thing. And then communication is about a transfer of ideas. Make sure you connect and then transfer the idea. There's a classic proverb that says they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The Ohana version of that is make sure they know how much you care before you ask for things to change. Connection first, idea transfer second. Now, a couple of quick seconds here. No sandwiches, don't do the compliment correct compliment because then people don't know when you open with a compliment if you really mean it or if you're just softening up the criticism. And they'll kind of, the, they'll withhold accepting the compliment until they know what's coming after. So just don't do that. So Ohana communication start as conversation begins with to try to understand. And so in my case, and I'm, I'm treating this like I'm on the receiving end to, to help illustrate. So she comes to me and she wants to know what my understanding is of the situation. She might ask like if I even know what happened. And if I know what happened, what are my thoughts about that? Do, do I think that the client was out of line? Do I think I can talk to the client? Do I think that she should have any authority? To understand the starting point and then, then to define some of the terms so that we can have a mutual understanding of using the same words the same way. Uh, one of the challenges we're having at this particular political moment is when you have the name of an organization matches a sentiment and someone states the sentiment or maybe the organization. And will that be a different discussion depending upon which side of that someone is actually expressing? It will. 
And what if you, instead of bothering to understand, you just like jump in and start arguing? But then you're gonna have a lot more arguments because you might not, you might be arguing a point that they're not making. So you understand first and then you define how are we using these words? What, what does this word mean when we use this in this conversation? And then you seek to be understood because now you have a shared vocabulary and you know what their starting point is. And so even just, even if a leader doesn't even care about the humanity of their people, just strategically, this makes sense because understand begins with help me know where you are, define is and help me understand how to give you directions so that I can give you directions from where you are. Because if you're gonna give me directions to Disneyland, well, the fact I'm in Irvine matters. Because the directions from Irvine are going to be different than the directions from St. Louis. They're gonna be different than the, than the directions from Sacramento. Definitely different than the, the directions from Honolulu, Hawaii. And so if you even just say understand is, where are you? Define is, how can I give you directions? I mean, are you the type of person I can tell you north, south, and street names? Or are you the type of person that I have to tell you, okay, drive until you see, or drive toward the water until you see the jack-in-the-box. Then make a left at the jack-in-the-box and go toward the roller coaster. And there'll be a parking lot past the roller coaster. And when you understand how someone uses words, you know how you can give them directions. And so the funny thing for here is, even for the people who don't care about people as people, just strategically, just logically, in a dry, treat them as a cog in a machine, you still want to do this. And certainly if you care about people, human heart to human heart, you absolutely want to communicate this way. Seeking first to understand is a conversational start to communication. Listen to understand rather than listen to judge. Listen to understand rather than listen to argue or listen to respond. Start with connection and understand, define, be understood because it starts with seeking to understand. It connects right on point because you're on your topic or it'll get there really fast. So we have the framework, Ohana 101, hero, villain, victim, and then conversation to communication, understand, define, be understood. Now you have the change sequence. How do you get things to change? Well, the softest thing to do is a simple request, is that you've connected, you've defined the problem, you've understood each other, and it could end up being that if you have agreement, you just request that they follow the agreement. Now, I don't have to do any big deal to ask someone to bring me the, the disc by Friday because the event's Friday after, after we close work. Very often, just making a request or making a suggestion is enough to solve the problem. Now, sometimes it isn't. So then you have what's called a training boundary. And a training boundary is there's going to be some interaction that if this line gets crossed, then something else is going to happen but that something else that's going to happen has the sole purpose of getting that line honored. So say we go back to, I just need a disc, something small, something that we don't have emotion about. I could just request that she bring it and she could bring it. She could like set her own timer or her own notification that'll go off when she goes home or put in her own calendar, all, all of these things that she could do to remind herself. But then if it gets forgotten anyway, part of the training boundary could be something like the agreement of, okay, well, because we already know it got forgotten, I'm going to send you a text or I'm going to call you and I want you to contact me back. Now, I tend to just set things like that up in the first place, just to allow for the humanity of people. But if someone has certain responsibilities that they routinely forget to do, especially if it's a new thing for them, a training boundary is just a follow-up system to make sure it happens. And it could be as simple a thing as you've got a new employee and they've got a new set of responsibilities as part of opening up and it's like a 45 minute process. And part of the training boundary is, okay, when you get done with each piece, pop into the office and tell me, okay, this machine's all set up and ready to go. 
and then go do the next part and then pop back in and tell me, okay, and this other thing is set up and ready to go. And then pop back in and tell me, okay, the register set up and I've got all the change set up in the register. So we're ready to open. And then come back and, and tell me, it's like, okay, and I think we're ready to open up the doors and I might step out there and take a look at everything. And that would be a reasonable training boundary for a brand new person who's just beginning to learn. I'm not just going to request, do everything we trained you to do. Like follow the 45 minute process that we spent 10 minutes telling you to do the first time you showed up and remember all of it. But the training boundary is just set up as a reminder. And this is useful for any time someone has to do a, a change they agreed to but it's not a habit, and especially when the habit is the opposite of the thing that they agreed to. The next level is an enforcement boundary. Now, enforcement boundary can show up whether they like it or not. Uh, a one enforcement boundary example could be if, well, I'll, I'll, I'll use a parenting version. So if I don't want smoking around my kids, but my dad smokes, and he insists upon smoking, an enforcement boundary can be as simple as, if you insist upon smoking in front of the kids, you are not welcome. And if you light up in front of the kids, I will ask you to leave. That would be an enforcement boundary, but it's based upon a particular behavior that you find unacceptable under a certain circumstance. Now, maybe it's like if we're out at a restaurant and you get up and you, you go smoke in the smoking section, that's fine. I just don't want any smoking in my house, period. You, I love. You are welcome. The smoking is not. And what an enforcement boundary is, is you're taking away the ability to cross that boundary line. You're not punishing someone, you're taking away their ability to violate a boundary. And th there's a lot more detail in training boundaries and enforcement boundaries. And then this last one is change the relationship. So changing the relationship could end up being like, well, we'll use the dad case of you are no longer welcome at my house because every time you come to the house, you insist upon smoking. So what we're going to do is we will meet, because I still want you to have a relationship with the kids, but we will now meet in public places. We'll meet at restaurants, we'll meet at parks where now the no smoking rules are being enforced by somebody else. So that way you'll still see the grandkids. I'm not saying you can't see the grandkids. I just can't have the smoking going on in my house. And it's a way to, adjust the relationship and that could, in a fairly tiny way because you're still spending time. Some is just as much time. You're just doing it under different circumstances, which helps illustrate the path of the change relationship is remove one relevant element. The next level is to remove a whole relevant part of a relationship, then the end the relevant role and the end the entire relationship. Now, some people think change relationship automatically means that fourth one. It might. I mean, with, with a particular employee, it could be as simple a thing as, okay, you, you don't deal with this particular client anymore. That's one relevant element. Or removing a relevant part could be a part of, okay, you'll still answer the phone and you'll still greet people, but we're just going to take this part of your job out. That's no longer going to be a part of your job. That you're so great at all these other things, so instead we'll have you like, do this other thing, but we're going to assign that part to this different person because the other person you know, doesn't have the same issues with the, these clients. And so if the client's a jerk, you know, he knows how to handle it and we'll, we'll just swap that out. So that's a relevant part. Ending a relevant role could be as similarly, okay, well, you can't be the receptionist anymore because that's just part of the job. Now that might not mean you fire them. That might mean you're going to move them. I mean, so that person might be a great legal secretary too. And so, well, how about I'm gonna have you be my legal secretary because you're a great person. I wanna keep you on my team, but just, you know, there's too many issues showing up too often in this, that I'm not gonna subject you to th those clients' behaviors, but I also don't want to lose you. And then the last one would be to end the entire relationship. And in a business sense, that could just be, okay, well, you, know, you, you can't work here. And there's three different levels of Ohana conversations. This is just a very one-on-one -on -one level of the change conversation. There's also something called an accountability conversation and an, an agreement conversation. And you can see the diagnostic power of this. So when you begin to understand the, the hero, villain, victim, you can see the vocabulary showing up and just how people talk about things. So rather than wait until there's a crisis and there's all of these emotions and opinions involved, you can address them when they're small. 
and just gently tweak how people talk about things and tweak how you talk about things so that you adjust to the hero frame and the hero villain victim. And in all of this stuff, getting deeper into Ohana, the more sophisticated your framework is, the more powerful it becomes and the more ways to win you get. And the Ohana five by five, it literally gives you 33 ways to win. And you just enter in at whatever your best win entry point is. And then self versions exist of all of this too, for self change, self accountability, self agreements, and that you can do all of that. And, and that is the core of this masterclass. And if it sounds like building Ohana would be more powerful, because it pre solves many people problems. In, in fact, Imagine if Deborah didn't know she could talk to me. Oh, it doesn't mean she doesn't have her opinions. It just means that she's not talking to me. And because we had a structure that tells her, okay, settle into your framework, here's how you communicate, and he here's how we try to create the change. And both of us have that framework. We can keep having these discussions. So the Ohana culture pre-solves many people problems. The Ohana culture powers relationship protecting resolution of problems. Well, just the fact that I was, I was interviewing the woman who was disagreeing with me 30 years ago and that we're still friends. So as you, we clearly protected that relationship, even though we were diametrically opposed on an issue for months be before the change happened. And uh, here's a key one. People like working with people that they like. And in fact, um, I'm collecting testimonials finally. I'm finally remembering to actually do that. And one of the women who wants to give me a testimonial is someone where I've only ever been her client. And her basic idea is like, you are such a joy to work with. All that thing you do, it's like, that's not just if you're the boss, that's if you're the client. I love working with you. Every time I see your name pop up on the list, I get excited, like, oh, I get to see Scott today. But, but there are other clients I see their name pop up and go, ah, oh, him again, okay. And so you want to be the client that's a joy to work with. And when problems are resolved well, it embeds genuine connection into the DNA of your relationship culture. So you have the cost of conflict. We talked about it at the beginning, the cost of conflict with one great client, the cost of conflict with a critical team member. One conflict could cost how, how much? It depends upon who you have the conflict with, right? 3,000 up to a quarter million, who knows? And then you have the joy of genuine connection, the benefit of, being the professional your best clients like and trust with their friends and colleagues. And the joy of being able to see a problem and walk in already knowing you're both going to win in the conversation. Does that sound like it's worth your time, your energy? Can you see it avoids costs none of us wanna pay and gives us benefits that all of us desire and think, is that worth your investment? Is it worth the investment of anyone that you know? So I grew up with Ohana and I still needed to have a system to share. If I figure if I grew up with it and I needed it, chances are high that we all need it. I've seen it have a tremendous benefit. And before I get to what the offer is, the, the, the hero, villain, victim framework is genius. I can't even tell you how many people have reported back to me that that was transformational. And explanatory too. It helped them understand, like in one case, why an entire marriage had been on a villain frame the whole time. And when you, you get that and the power of that, that part's huge. And the understand, define, be understood sequence is priceless. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to go quick through this part because there's just a lot of cool parts in teaching this that you, you have the, the two page that. Uh, have produced. And, and by the way, this, this one, honestly, right now, you can get this for free. This is available on my website. And so if you go through some of the things because of all of the stuff we have going on, I decided, you know, rather than keep all of this in the program, I, I'm, I'm just going to let people have chunks of this. So, th so this is available for free. And it's just as a reminder of one minute per day. And just to understand daily is powerful. And I'm not gonna unpack a lot of, of this right now, just as a matter of time, but just having the reminder, just investing a minute a day, even 10 seconds a day. As a pastor, I just ask my congregants, 10 seconds a day with God. 
Read and recite one verse and say thank you to God. Boom. Done. You touch base with God for the day. As a martial arts grandmaster, I ask my students to train one minute a day, 60 seconds. And it's just that daily reminder to tell your brain daily. Is more better? Sure. Yes, absolutely. I'm totally in for more. But more is only better if you actually do it. Daily and done beats would have been more if I got around to it. Daily and done. But that, that two-page thing, that, that's available for free on the website. Go to, to scottwith1t.com and just sign, sign up through the link and you can get, get to that download. And you also in, in the program and right now for free, you can get a copy of the Ohana Way Report and that's also there in the PDF. Just click on the picture. You can download the Ohana Way Report. Now this is a short book. Back, at, back in the day, it was literally a report I would print up on my printer, staple together and hand to people in my dojo. And when we made it into a book, we still called it the Ohana Way Report because that's what it was when it started. That's also available for free right now. And that'll unpack the basics of the Ohana Five of Oasis, Harmony, Assertiveness, Nobility, and Aloha. And then also available for free on the website is the Ohana Way book, the full book, the 200 page book in its original edition. Now, these aren't the new uh, 30th anniversary editions, but they're available for free in PDF on the website. And you can dive into the five by five. And then there's a workbook, and the workbook's not available for, for free because that is only really applicable in the program itself. But you can get that two-page download. You can get the Ohana Way Report and the Ohana Way book all downloaded for free right now. Now, if you want the rest of the program, there's the six-lesson audio course. There's a download, uh, sorry, let me rephrase it. Six lesson video course, downloadable audio course. I almost said that backwards. And then there's a course handouts for that whole thing. And those are, are part of the, the 297 program. And there's a triple touch technique system. I actually uh, have that reviewed in the program itself, so I won't spend much time on it. But just to know, Earl Nightingale, the grandfather of the entire self-help industry, all the way up to the little old me, all recommend going through things at least three times, once for awareness, once light attention, and once for focus attention. And uh, the, these lessons are actually uh, kicked off in there and are also in the 30th uh, anniversary edition of the book so that you have that available. But I'll tell you, here's the big one. I have a six week live online Ohana conversation training where you get to learn and practice the pieces. Now, remember I told you that there's some of the parts that there's some, some complexity in there to understand. It's not complicated, but you, you have to have some insight into how that works that I'm not gonna cover in what, one quick masterclass. And then getting in and practicing it and having a Q&A period over an arc of six weeks as we just touch on uh, Ohana, Oasis, Harmony, Assertiveness, Nobility, and Aloha. And then we go in direct application. How do we use that? How does that apply in this framework? How does that apply in this conversation strategy? How do these pieces of this work so that we can really make it make a difference and so that you can have the kind of outcomes like when thanks to Deborah knowing that she can have these conversations with me, we had a 450% increase in my business, in my business, because she knew she could have these conversations. That this is powerful for dispute resolution. This is powerful for protecting your best clients, for protecting your business, for guarding the presence of your key people, your key partnerships, your networks, your referral partners. But this stuff is enormously powerful. One of my colleagues just contacted me over the weekend to let me know that she, she stuck to the format. She did the one, two, three pieces and she solved a $150,000 problem with someone she'd been struggling with for months. And she just stuck to the format and she got her outcome. So that six week live online Ohana training really unpack that. And you know, rather than go through all of that, but you just think about like the dollar value of that. For, the, for this one woman, it was a $150,000 solution. What is it for us? And those are the pieces, what, what it can possibly be worth. On the six-week live Ohana conversation training, I'm not going to put $150,000 on it. That's just what it was worth to her. 
But very legitimately, you think about what can it get you and what can it save you? And I only charge $19.97 for this normally. But right now, because commonly I'll follow it up with a live event. And as things were opening, I thought, oh, well, we're, we're good. I, I can do my live event late August, early September, not a problem. But in a lot of places, they're, they're re-shutting down. And they're shutting down again because there, there's been spikes in cases and spikes in hospitalizations. And so I got, okay, so I should take the live event off the table. If I'm going to take the live event off the table, that's about $500 of my hard costs that's going away. So I go, okay, well, I'll, I'll only charge $14.97 for anyone who wants to go through this right now. And so we'll, we'll do this cheaper. And uh, something and I don't have this in here yet is I'm also going to offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So like literally, if you go through the, the first four classes, so most of the way through the class and said, you know, this, I don't really think I'm getting that much value out of it. You can keep all the downloads, you can keep the workbook, keep the audios, keep the videos. You got two thirds of the class and I'll give you all your money back. And I think, I mean, that's how confident I am in the power of this. And so if someone's interested in this, I'm going to be retooling this on my website so that it's available for 1497. And when you think about the ROI on that, well, like the woman who just saved $150,000 in a deal by sticking to the format or whatever it would be worth to you, if it helps you get one client, what is one client worth in your world? If it helps you keep one referral partner happy enough to send you one more referral, what is that worth? And so I've got 297 if you just want the downloaded part. And I'm going to finish up with, with one last piece of content on the people principles that come out of this. Be good company while enjoying good company. Be a plus, not a minus. Be a partner, not an opponent. And if we do this with people, this is all very Ohana. You're recruiting someone to be someone who makes things better. On the be good company while enjoying good company, all that means is whenever you're with people, Try to be pleasant company and look for the good in the company someone else is being. And if there's business involved, still do all of your business, but do it in a very good company, good company way, rather than a, well, business is business and we're just going to do business. Um, I, I learned this Ohana principle from my father. Now, my mother was the island girl. So I learned Ohana from my mother, but I learned the business application from my father. He used to say, business may be business the business people are still people. And so I learned from my dad that all that Ohana stuff you're learning from your mom to, to do family with people, that applies in business. That my dad's 72 employees were not just cogs in the Conway machine. He considered them family and they considered themselves family. And they did stuff for each other above and beyond the job description and the KPIs or the, the, the key performance indicators because they liked each other. And he says, when, even when you have to reprimand someone, you don't want to be mean about it because by the time you're done getting the change you want done, you want them to go back to work and still like you. And you want them to go back to work and you still want to like them. And if you're not going to like each other, then why are you working together? Because we, we spend more hours together at work than we spend with our families. And it's because, you know, if, if you show up for eight hour days, 40, 40 days a week working with someone, you want to like them. So be good company while enjoying good company. I use that everywhere from dating to business. Be a plus, not a minus. And that's just be cognizant that negativity is a minus. Positivity is a plus. Just complaining about stuff is a minus. Offering solutions is a plus. And on balance, you always want to be a plus, not a minus. And then finally, and this one's huge, be a partner, not an opponent. With business partners, sometimes they forget. You're on the same side. You're in business together. With suppliers and vendors, you're on the same side. And when problems arise, just remember, you're partners. You're on the same side. You're not opponents. And as a pastoral counselor, I can't even tell you that, that probably I'd say 80 to 90% of the married couples I counseled, their fundamental problem was they forgot to be partners, not opponents. And so 
I've used this in, in all sorts of frameworks. So hopefully I'll see you soon in the Discover Ohana course. I'll be updating the website to the new prices actually today. So if you're seeing this on the replay, hopefully that means that's already done. And then for those of you who are here live, uh, I, I hope that that's somewhat exciting. And, and right now there, that's at the, the full price. But that, that's what I'm doing. Now, well, uh, and I will open to any Q&A before we wrap up and, and as I, I learn my timing on this too. I don't have any questions, Scott, but I just want to say this was an awesome webinar. Um, even not just for business, but in life in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, being that plus and not that minus and going into a conversation with not a motive of judgment, but of understanding. It's like, you know, I, 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 I start thinking about some things. I'm like, oh, I do things the opposite way sometimes, especially with my family because they're my family, right? Mm hmm but it's like, no, seek to understand and I might learn something new about them that I've never known before. So this was totally awesome. I really appreciate it. Well, it is my pleasure. Thank you, Scott. And um, I deal with, a, I've got a couple hundred different clients. So what's the best way to get word out about your program to my clients? Um, well, I will have a link set up soon and, and, uh, once I have that set up, I think I have your, your registration, so I should have your email. Is the email you registered with the best email to reach you at? Yes. All right. Well, perfect. Well, I will be updating my website and getting that set today, and um, I'll, I'll get that out to you as soon as I have that done. Okay. Yeah, send me a link, too, because I like to post that in my Facebook group. All right. Fantastic. Well, I will do that for both of you. <laughs> yes. Right. And, and thank you very much, because I'll, I'll, I'll share with you one of my ultimate fantasies. So people say like, like well, where would you like this to all go? And, and what do most of us say? It's like, well, if I could make a million dollars or I could like, we, we have our business goal. One of my personal fantasies is during my life to listen to some people talk about some of these things like that it's a self-evident truth. And I'm hearing them teach exactly what I teach and they don't know it came from me. It's just so self-evident to them. And so I appreciate you being a part of that for me, of getting the word out so enough people can learn this because then hopefully three or four iterations past them when they're doing it, they won't even remember they got it from me. They'll just be doing it because like, well, it's obvious. Why would you do this any other way? So thank you both very, very thank much you. for being nice a part you. of that. Nice to meet you. And uh, we'll see both of you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Aloha. 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 Aloha.